Grand Portage Resources recently completed the 2018 drill program on its 100% controlled Herbert Gold Discovery property located in the prolific Juneau Belt in southeast Alaska. Drill results are expected through late 2018. Past drill results included numerous multi-ounce gold assays on multiple veins. Grand Portage trading symbols are GPG on the TSX Venture, GPTRF on the OTCQB, and GPB on Frankfurt. For more information, please visit our website, grandportage.com. Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Cheryl McComsey, founder of Pesticide Free Alberta. Welcome back to the show, Cheryl. Hello. Cheryl, we talked about the so-called dirty dozen, the, the foods that are most likely to be contaminated with uh, all kinds of pesticides and herbicides. And I think I fell victim. I ate some strawberries three weeks ago, broke out in a giant rash, had to see the doctor right away who loaded me up with uh, all kinds of nasty medications. But they did clear it up. And she said I was the third or fourth person who had come in with a reaction to the chemicals in the strawberries, not the strawberries themselves. Was I a fluke or or does this happen a lot? I don't think that's a fluke, but it's uh, quite remarkable and wonderful that uh, somebody in healthcare would actually be thinking that, yes, this isn't just strawberries that people are allergic to. It's probably what's on the strawberries, and that strawberries do get quite a number of pesticides sprayed on them and that they're porous. So even if you wash them, some of these pesticides don't just come off easily. So it's wonderful to hear, uh, sad to hear for you, but good to hear that someone's making that connection because I suspect that it happens more often than we know. We don't always make that connection. Yes, she said, oh, you've fallen victim to the dirty dozen. What are the <laughs> dirty dozen? What is the dirty dozen? Um, well, there is a list from the Environmental Working Group that uh, they kind of pick the foods that they feel that have the highest amount of contamination from pesticide residues sprayed on them. Um I can't say that I always agree 100% with this list because there are some things that some people, you know, have said, how come this is not on there or that's not on there? But it is one way that people can, you know, reduce their exposure to pesticides in their food if they kind of stick to that list. There are some foods that certainly do get more pesticides on them than others. Um, they sort of stick to fruits and vegetables. And, um, I, I, you know, when it comes to grains and things, I would definitely want to stick to organic uh, grains for the same reason that, you know, especially in North America, we still desiccate these crops with uh, glyphosate, et cetera. Right. Now, uh, I guess you could just, what, Google the dirty dozen with quotation marks? Yeah, actually, if you just go to what's called the Environmental Working Group, um, this is a, a U.S.-based group, but it really does kind of... Um, follow with what we do here in Canada because, as you've heard before, um, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and Health Canada's Best Management Regulatory Agency really work together on deciding what's allowed on our market. And um, our climates are somewhat similar for most of the foods that we grow. So that that list is useful. We also import unfortunately import a lot of our food from the US so i would think that it's still quite a useful list to use so if you just google environmental working group and the dirty dozen or if you do a search on their page it, you'll find that list they have a lot of good information on there also about the concerns with the pesticides that you'll find on some of these foods it's quite remarkable um salary is one of the worst ones and I think a lot of people look at salary and they go really salary <laughs> but it's um, it's a worthwhile thing to do if you if you're not able to afford to buy all your produce as organic mm -hmm. now Maple Leaf Foods is going to build uh, the largest plant-based protein facility in Ontario is plant-based protein better for you than animal protein all the time or do you have to be careful there too I would not eat a plant-based protein at all unless it's organic. 
um, there was uh, an assessment done. This is a really interesting story because we have, uh, you know, limits, acceptable limits on a lot of foods, but are they to actually test it? Well, uh, we found out that glyphosate is not tested on our food, and uh, um, Tony Mitra, from your area there, pressured the federal government to do testing uh, of glyphosate on our food. And what he found was that the proteins, uh, the legumes, and those kinds of uh, uh, crops had the highest levels and above acceptable limits in a lot of cases in, in things like chickpeas and uh, lentils, et cetera. So I definitely would not um, consume a plant-based protein unless it's organic because you're going to be exposed to higher levels of glyphosate, for one thing. And we know that those uh, that herbicide is linked to gut issues. We even have studies showing uh, it causes gut disturbances in bees. But um, <laughs> quite remarkable. So it's actually registered as an antimicrobial, and it shows on studies that it messes with gut flora. So definitely do we want to be consuming a food that has higher levels of a gut-disturbing herbicide like glyphosate. I certainly wouldn't want to. I wish there was something like a home test kit where you could put your food in and, oh, it turned purple. It means it's got this stuff in it. Is there anything out there like that? Well, I've heard little murmurs of um, something like that um, being created. I'm not sure how much I would trust it. It might be good once... I mean, I've heard of something like that coming onto the market, but I haven't actually looked at it yet. I would wonder how sensitive it is, and I don't know how you're going to test um, for for pesticides that are in your food either. Like a lot of a lot of pesticides are not just on the surface anymore; they're inside food. So, um, I mean, to me, instead of spending money on something to test my food, I think I would prefer to to uh, spend the money on getting the cleanest food possible by going to local organic producers. You're also going to get a food that's probably higher in nutritional value when you go to a local farmer because it's going to be fresher. So there's more than one reason to buy local organic food. There's there's so many reasons one could go into. But um, just testing for pesticide residues with a little instrument, I would... I, I would want to know a lot of things about how sensitive it is, what it actually tests. And when you know how many pesticides are on the market today, I don't know how you could do that accurately. Unless you have your own spectrograph at home. <laughs> yeah, like uh, one of the things that I'm reviewing right now is um, the guidelines for our drinking water in Canada and the guidelines, the guidelines are not standards. I think it's really important for Canadians to know the difference between guidelines and standards. Guidelines are kind of like, would you pretty please stick to this level? Standards are legally binding, and so we should have standards. We have guidelines. And looking at the guidelines, um, which I had looked at before, but um, I've been trying to see if anything has changed. And recently in the news, they did say that they had uh, reduced the acceptable limit for lead, but um, when I'm looking at other things on this list, we don't meet what the World Health Organization recommends on many pesticides in our drinking water. Atrazine is is a big one that's mentioned as having uh, huge impacts on reproductive um, issues for human beings and for animals both. And uh, the World Health Organi- Organization recommends a level of 0.002 micrograms per liter. In Canada, our level is 0.005 micrograms per liter, double. And Australia, and even um, I haven't had a chance to look at the U.S., but previously the U.S. also had lower levels. But Australia and the EU all have lower levels by very wide margins we have a higher acceptable limit for atrazine. But there's many pesticides and heavy metals that we have 
higher levels of acceptable limits as opposed to what the World Health Organization recommends. So why are we not even meeting that? I, I find that quite shocking. We'll have more with Cheryl McComsey right after the break. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Magnum Gold Corp, MGI and the TSX Venture Exchange. A 2015 drill program on the LH property intersected several high-grade gold intersections, including 11 meters of 20.66 grams per ton gold. Additional drill targets on the LH property have been identified by a 2018 drone airborne magnetic survey to further evaluate a pyrotite enriched gold bearing system. Please visit our website at magnumgoldcorp.com. MGX Minerals is revolutionizing the new energy economy with patented lithium extraction technology replacing traditional solar evaporation using low-cost, low-energy nanofiltration. The first system of this paradigm shift technology is currently being commissioned. MGX Minerals trades on the CSE, symbol XMG, the OTCQB, symbol MGXMF, and Frankfurt, symbol 1MG. For more information, visit our website, mgxminerals.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Cheryl McComsey. Cheryl, for people in the lower mainland of BC, it's already gardening season. And for the rest of Canada, pretty soon, uh, the soil's going to be nice and warm and you'll be planting stuff there. Uh, what should we not be doing with our gardens? One thing I would really recommend everyone does is ask their greenhouse if they use neonics in their greenhouse or if their supplier uses neonics. And if the greenhouse doesn't know what you're talking about, I would send an email to the owner and say you would like to know if any of their plants have neonics. Otherwise, you're going to be planting plants in your garden that have these insecticides in them that are known to be very harmful to bees in particular, but pretty much all insect life. And in Edmonton, when I was hearing that some people were having problems with certain pests in their garden and I wasn't, I got very curious and found studies that show that uh, neonics also impact predator species to some of the pests in our garden. So not only are you probably impacting bees, and most of us love bees and want to see bees in our garden and around our flowers and vegetables and so on, but we could also be creating a problem in our garden that we're, we're kind of unaware of just because this insecticide is in our soil. And it doesn't just, again, miraculously disappear. It could be there for years. There's no way of really knowing it. And the, and the ba- uh, breakdown products can also be harmful. So this is something that I know some groups in the U.S. have pressured um, some big retailers like Lowe's, for example, and Home Depot. And so some of the tags you'll see on plants that say um, that there are neonics in these plants. But um, one thing is I wouldn't be really angry with Lowe's that they're actually taking some initiative to do that labeling. A lot of places are not telling you. So you have to ask. And I think it's really important because I think most of us really do care about bees. So you see that in the public, that there is a concern about that, but I don't think people really realize that what they're buying could be also contributing to that problem. Yeah, uh, I'm deathly afraid of being stung, but I know bees are different than hornets. And so when a bee was stuck inside my window the other day, I really carefully uh, <laughs> kind of herded it back outside again <laughs> yeah. because I know how important, and, and bees are not aggressive, at least no, not bees, yet. <laughs> if they sting you... They, they die. Die. So, so they're, they're um, in knowing that, yeah. um, a bee doesn't sting you because it's aggressive. It stings you as a to protect the hive, basically. So, yeah, in general, if we're kind of calm around them, they're they're not gonna sting you. Uh, they'll they're not an issue. But and without them, we're gonna have serious problems. And actually, it's very interesting if you look into wild bees. Wild bees are actually more important than honeybees. Um, and do more pollination than honeybees. And we don't even know all the species of wild bees that we have. We haven't even been able to um, uh, keep a record of all of that. And if you look on some websites, you'll find it very interesting that some of the wild bees are so small that you wouldn't even recognize them as being a bee. So that's a, that's another thing that could uh, people might find interesting is just to educate yourself about what what wild bees look like. 
Yes, I saw the Burnaby Parks Department actually put up little bee houses for solitary bees. They look like little bird houses, but they just have a tiny hole and uh, and no little place for a bird to stand on. So I thought that was uh, pretty nice of the Parks Department to do that. Yeah, I think people are doing little things like that, which is great. Um, you know, creating a place for bees to create nests. I mean, bees will even create a nest in your in your uh, in the soil as well. A lot of people don't realize that. Um, but and also having different a variety of different things in your garden that blooms at different times is going to help to feed bees. I mean, the problem with uh, with some things that we do is that we have a plant that will bloom at one time, and then what are bees supposed to eat the rest of the time? So we need to have variety for that reason in our garden as well. But uh, bees are incredibly important. If we if we lose our insect, and we are losing a lot of insects, uh, we're also losing some species of birds that rely on insects for their diet, and neonics are even... Uh, showing in studies to be poisonous to a number of species of birds, uh, quite quite poisonous, and even human beings, deer even. So um, we don't want to be using these pesticides. They're not necessary, really, in, in a greenhouse. Uh, they're, they're to deal with aphids in general in, in a greenhouse. We don't, we don't need them. There's other things we can do. And, and there's organic greenhouses out there. But a lot of the smaller um, businesses don't use them. Uh, at least that's been my experience when I've kind of checked around. There's like when I was living in Edmonton, there was like 40 or so greenhouse su- suppliers in the Edmonton area. So it was a huge task to try to contact them all. And people want that information, but it takes some work. But as a person who might go to maybe two or three different greenhouses in your community, it's not that much work to ask them <clears throat> that question and know that if they're importing stuff from another greenhouse, that those plants could still have neonics in them. We'll have more with Cheryl McComsey right after this. I'm Kelly Jennings, CEO of PowerVan Solutions. PowerVan is a cloud-based provider of auction, inventory, and finance solutions that make buying, selling, and financing vehicles more efficient. PowerVan Solutions trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol PBX and on the OTCQB symbol PWWBF and on Frankfurt symbol 1ZV. For more information, please visit us at PowerBandSolutions.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Cheryl McComsey. Cheryl, people also, besides gardening, they're going to be preparing their lawns for the spring and uh Everybody who wants the perfect lawn does not want dandelions. Is there any organic way to deal with broadleaf plants like that? Well, the the best thing, like with anybody's health or the health of a plant or your garden or your lawn, is to create the conditions that are conducive to healthy turf. So that means um, having things like compost teas which nourish the microbes in the soil, which will create space in that soil for the microbes to uh, make space for things like water. So it can, your, your lawn will take up water and retain water for a longer period of time. Um, I wouldn't use chemicals uh, as far as synthetic fertilizers. That's not the best way to nourish your lawn. It'll be um, something that takes away from exactly what we're talking about here. And to overseed your lawn. And also, uh, when it comes to dandelions, I, I would still say that the best way is to remove it, get a good tool to remove it if, if you don't want them there, or to find a way to tolerate a little bit of weeds in your lawn. If you mow the grass before the dandelion goes to seed, they're not going to spread everywhere. If you have healthy turf, you're not going to have a lot of weeds. You're not going to have to water your lawn as often. Uh, mowing high is one thing that people recommend as well so that your uh, grass doesn't dry out so quickly. 
And then also to consider whether you really want a lawn. Like, of course, we want to have turf in areas where we're going to be playing soccer or maybe where your kids are playing on the grass. But in other areas, there are so much better alternatives to having turf. Why are, why have the most labor-intensive um, plant, uh, which is turf, growing in our yard when we can have easier-to-maintain plants? Well, a lot of cities won't allow people to plant gardens, for example, in their front yard. Mm-hmm. Should they allow people to plant their own garden? But should people be, be allowed allow- to plant their own garden? Yeah, in their front yard. Oh, sure, why not? It can be done very well. Um, in Edmonton, they had a category for edible yard, and it can be quite beautifully done. I had, it was kind of funny, I had a section of strawberries in my front yard, and people were always asking me, what's that little flower, what's that little white flower in your ground cover there? Um, I found that really funny that people didn't recognize it as a strawberry. And then in another little section where it was really dry and things didn't grow well, I had chives. You know, chives are edible. And I had little steaks with dragonflies, and it was quite attractive. You can make things very attractive and grow food. Um, and, I mean, when you look at everybody's lawn, uh, I don't know what the aversion is to growing food. In, in Florida, they actually had a law that you were not allowed at one time to grow food in your yard. They just changed that law so people can now grow food in their front yard. It's, yeah. it's something that... Um, I think as uh, things change with with climate change and the uh, concerns around what that can do. I mean, Iowa is currently underwater right now. It's it's quite horrific what's going on there. Having local food production, even if it's in your front yard, so that you can afford to eat more organic food, is awesome. And so I think we have to be a little bit flexible about that. Well, also, too, I saw a tremendous documentary about how soil is formed, and earthworms are soil machines, how uh, one earthworm will come up out of the earth at night and devour uh, leaves, fallen leaves, like uh, some kind of incredible uh, machine, uh, meters worth. And I thought in the fall, instead of having all these people walking around with leaf blowers, we should be <laughs> scattering earthworms along the lawns yeah. because... In two or three days, all those leaves will be gone, and the earthworm, earthworms would have eaten them. Well, it's interesting you bring that up. Somebody else was just talking about leaves uh, today to me about how awesome they are. And in our back alley where, you know, people, what do you want to grow in the back alley? I mean, you just, what are you going to grow there? But we had in our back alley where we lived, it was like dead pan, hard cake soil. Well, my husband was putting some leaves back there uh, one fall, and uh, quite a few. By the next year, that soil was fabulous. I couldn't believe how quickly it transformed that soil. And we grew potatoes back there. We grew potatoes back there. <laughs> I'm like, very unconventional, yes, but when you walk in a back alley, what do you really see? You see, you know, uncapped pieces of turf back there. Nobody wants to really do anything with it. And, and and it's just something to look after. But why not use that space to grow something like potatoes? Potatoes suppress weeds. And we had, you know, neighbors would walk by and I'd hand them a couple potatoes and, and uh, we'd have these little conversations about growing something different in a place you wouldn't think of growing food before. It was awesome. So leaves are awesome. Um, they're... People get rid of them, they throw them away, but they're actually a resource. It's, it's like conversation I've been having with people is we think of gar- uh, garbage as uh, things that are actually a resource, like our compost pail. That's a resource that we're throwing away, and we should be using it. And municipalities have to start thinking more and more about their garbage and what they're doing with it and start thinking of it as a resource instead of something to get rid of. When I lived in Winnipeg, I bought, it looks like a, a little pyramid, but it's actually a, a slatted thing where you just put your compost in, and uh, I rounded up some earthworms, and it was the best soil ever for planting all the plants around the house. My my wife has a tremendously green thumb. She rescues 
abandoned plants from alleys and stuff that people have thrown out. She, <laughs> the way some people collect uh, stray cats, she collects stray uh-huh. plants. Yeah, and if you're living in a condo or an apartment complex, and, um, you know, where I used to work, we had a compost built, uh, bin for the store that I worked at for, for a little while. Um, and there's no reason why you can't do that. So all the scraps that people had from their lunches, like, you know, banana peels and all that, like, went into this compost bin. So, you know, it takes a little bit of organization, you know, like maybe someone from the building where you live, you know, has to kind of get that organized. But why not? Why not create uh, something good out of what we normally think of something to throw away? Cheryl, anything else you wanted to add before uh, we wrap up the interview? No, I just hope everybody gets out and enjoys their spring. And if you don't have your own garden, you know, you can often grow something on your on your deck, like a little bit of parsley on the deck. It's nice to put into your pesto sauce, and or get involved with some of your community gardens out there and uh, and uh, get your hands dirty. Cheryl, how can people get more information about the things we talked about today? You can email us at pesticidefree number four Canada at gmail.com. Cheryl, thanks a lot. Thank you. My guest has been Cheryl McComsey, founder of Pesticide Free Alberta. She was speaking to us from the beautiful town of Powell River, BC. I'm Jim Goddard. If you have any questions for the show or for our guests like Cheryl, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. Thanks for listening. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.